I'm Hugh Hewitt. It's the anniversary show. 22 years done, the 23rd year of the Hugh Hewitt show begun, and my 40th wedding anniversary yesterday. And I wanted to do an in-depth author interview on my anniversary show because that's one of the things I'm known for on radio is actually reading the books. Noah Rothman has written a fabulous new book, The Rise of the New Puritans, Fighting Back Against the Progressives' War on Fun. And the rise of the new Puritans in the bookstore everywhere. You can get it at Amazon. Noah joins me now. Good morning, Noah. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. Thanks for having me here. You know, I had to I had to read this uh, en route to Cleveland uh, via Pittsburgh and LaGuardia. So I sat next to lefties on both planes, and they're looking at the cover, thinking the rise of the new okay. Progressives, the war on fun, and I'm getting funny looks. I think at the end of this, I believe that the country is now at peak woke. Do you agree? <laughs> It very well could be. Um, we might be on the downswing. You never know when you're in the middle of it, right? But you do see signs that there's a backlash building, that there's frustration among people who are Democrat. I mean, the people I spoke with, nine out of 10 of them, liberal, identify as Democrat, vote Democrat, wouldn't vote Republican if you put a gun to their head. But they resent the conditions that are sapping them of enthusiasm for their life's work. They don't get to do the way, if you're, this is, book is all about cultural products. If you produce a cultural product, you don't get to focus on your work anymore, not exclusively. You have to focus not, on the political oh, by, conditions. By no means. Around. Here's the good news. Uh, the, the progressive woke left does not read influential books from the center right. They don't read Guy Benson. They don't read you. They don't read Mary Catherine Ham. So they do not know how bad you gig them. You gig them like the emperor gig uh, Russell Crowe at the end of Gladiator. They do not know they're bleeding out in the pages of uh, the rise of the new Puritans, do they? Or have they figured it out and have they come for you? Uh, I've gotten a little bit of flack suggesting I'm over the target, but like you say, you know, there is a lot of resistance among people who are who are predisposed towards this movement, progressive Puritanism, or are cowed and intimidated by it. So, yeah, I, I sense we're breaking through a little bit, but there's more work to be done. I, I am in awe of the work that you put into this, Noah, because you had to dive deep into the woke left, and that comes... I've decided, based upon references, the woke left lives at Vox. They live at the auditorial pages of the New York Times, and they are overwhelmingly populated by law professors. If I actually did a count, I would bet that you are the author who has quoted more law professors than any other author in America in the course of actually reading their work. And most of them, as I know, I've been teaching con law for since 1996. Most of them are pretty far down the rabbit hole of the left. Sure. Well, I mean, the focus of this book attempts to be that which should be outside the political arena. We've got, Politics has infected things that don't respond to politics, don't respond to legislative remedies. We've imposed political themes on things like sports, fashion, culture, uh, your entertainment products, the family, uh, and the food you eat, the comedy you enjoy. All this stuff should exist outside of politics. It has been subsumed into a political milieu that doesn't serve it well, that saps it of the enjoyment that you otherwise would have. And, you know, because if, if you dive down into the historical strains here, which I attempted to do, I attempt to try to decode this puzzle. You know, you've been staring at this puzzle. Why has this happened? Why all of a sudden have the tendencies that we've sort of attributed to the right, this uh, priggishness, prudishness, and uh, an idea that innocent cultural fare can corrupt you and degrade society. That was a tendency we used to attribute to the right, the left by contrast emphasize self-gratification, self-fulfillment, hedonism, even at the expense of self-destruction. That has changed over the course of maybe a decade and rapidly in the space of uh, cultural evolution. And why? The why of it makes sense when you begin to dive into the intellectual strains of progressivism. As the left identifies more with progressivism and less with liberalism, classical or otherwise, they've adopted its habits of mind, among them utopianism, a hatred of idleness, a fear of idleness, that which is idle, which does not contribute to the progressive project, is worse than worthless. It's actively detrimental to the progressive project. And if you pull on that thread, you get to 19th century progressivism. And you pull a little bit more, you get to 16th century, 8th, 17th century Puritanism, the strains of mainline Protestantism that evolved into what we understand to be nascent progressivism. So it's sort of a decoder ring to help you understand why we got to this lamentable place and a set of prescriptions on how to get out. You spent, uh, I'm going to go to the end now, and I'm going to give away the end. Everything comes full circle. Uh, Noah begins with the Puritan settlement of uh, Massachusetts, and he ends with Increase Mather, my favorite name among the Puritans. 
Increased Mather lived, and I did not know how long he lived, 84 years. He, he, he spanned the 17th and the 18th century. Increased Mather ended, as you recount in Rise of the New Puritans, um, depressed, uh, upset that the project had failed. And it failed because not only Charles the I, but generally American mercantilism was incompatible with puritanical zeal. And it had to give way among many of the same forces, which I see, Noah, and I want to know if you're an optimist. I'm very optimistic that we are at peak woke. It falls apart now because you cannot maintain a market for that which people do not want, whether it's ESPN or the NFL or any of the other things we talk about in here. It just will not work. And increase Mather rude that. And I think there will be in, in 50 years, you might be updating this in 50 years if you're long lived, because this is the first shot warning them they have gone too far and the market will rebel. Right. So um, one of the things that you probably think of when you think of a, a stereotypical Puritan, first of all, scholars of Puritans really don't like it when we uh, lean into our stereotypes of Puritanism, which are mostly formed in the 19th century and the Victorianism and the Comstockery into which it evolved. Puritans themselves get a pretty bad rap. Um, but yes, Increase Mather lived to see that what he understood to be the death of his experiment. Um, he was rather bitter, not only towards his environment, but his fellow Puritans to have, that they have failed to live up to his vision. But, it, you know, the, tri the witch trials is one of those things that you think about as a stereotype. And that really is the final throw of what had otherwise been a terminal illness that had been building over the course of 30 years as the covenant that Puritans had established between the church and the state. There was no distinction between the two. Um, but the crown, through its interventions and over the course of uh, a series of moral crises after King Philip's war, um, dissolved this covenant, and Puritans had to make a, a series of compromises with that. And that breakdown of this environment that they understood, that they knew how to navigate, created the conditions for incohate moral panics. And then you look around you and you see this dissolving covenant, incohate moral panics, and it all starts to make a fair amount of sense to a degree that I thought was rather shocking. The parallels are very striking. But it also begins with this understanding that what they are trying to achieve here is it cannot be achieved. This kind of homogenized monoculture in which the totalitarian Puritan vision thrived. Now, totalitarian, by which I don't mean authoritarian, they were radically democratic. But they also imposed on their, their fellow congregants and their fellow citizens a way of life, a modus vivendi, um, which is what I think we're witnessing here. It mimics a secular faith, but it is not a faith. It is a a theory of social organization that has no room for uh, and cannot tolerate dissent. I, I want to tell people that in the rise of the new Puritans, and by the way, Noah, Frank Luntz's rule is if you do not say the title of the book seven times in any interview, oh, you're not doing your job. So I've got four in, but you have to start mentioning the rise of the new Puritans. Thank you. I or do. you're not going to get yeah. fighting back against war on fun. You're not the first to tell yeah. me this. I'm terrible. I know you've got to repeat the rise of the new Puritans seven times in every segment or it won't sell. And right now it's at 2000 and Amazon and skyrocketing up. I want to thank you for introducing me to, I mean, your scholarship is pretty good here. No, I've done a lot of reading on early American, Judas Clark taught me early American political thought, but I had never come across the tithing man before. And the tithing man was the Puritan zeal to patrol of all things, the family in many of the same ways. I, I found it very provocative that you identify <clears throat> peak woke as opposed to the progressive as opposed to the family as we understood it even 50 years ago. The family is no longer your family. It's the movement's family. Right. Well, in the Puritan's time, the family was the primary economic unit of society. Um, and it could not be, you could not trust it to police itself. You could not trust it to structure itself um, because it was so pivotal, pivotal rather, to the, the central animating thesis of, of Puritanism, making this whole experiment work. Uh, and that was the const constabulary that enforced this were tithing men who visited homes, ensured that children were being properly disciplined. Now, that's the sort of thing that you would think if you steep yourself in the sort of the liberalism that we grew up with, that we understood through all our adult lives, which was very permissive uh, when it came to parenting, emphasized, de-emphasized discipline, emphasized affection, emphasized learning through experimentation. It was called progressive parenting. It has fallen out of favor along with this idea that you can be trusted to organize and structure your own family. We have been um, offloading a lot of these responsibilities to the state to a degree that I think encourages um, abuses. Uh, we talk about very 
very overactive courts, a conspiracy of very overactive courts, child protective services departments, and families who are invested in policing other families in ways that are vir virtue, uh, verge on paranoid um, to a degree yeah, well, that has... That has resulted in abuses. Families, there's something like 20,000 kids a year are now removed from their, their caretakers, their parents, for the space of 24 hours and simply returned right back to them because nothing had occurred except the fact that the state was a little concerned that you weren't parenting properly. Part of the constabulary is actually NPR. Now, I, I love NPR. I worked for PBS for 10 years on TV. And you work for part of the constabulary, as I used to, MSNBC. And, and CNN is part of the constabulary. I never ask people to, to uh, rag on the people with whom they work because I don't do it. You don't do it. There are only two kinds of center right people on uh, legacy media, and they are either missionaries or refugees. You're a missionary. I was a missionary. Refugees are a different category. So you're a missionary. You're doing good work. But Madison University's Travis Ryder says to NPR, here's a provocative thought. Maybe we should protect our kids by not having them. That's not provocative. No, that's <laughs> stupid. And there's a lot of self-evidently stupid things that the zeal, the momentum inevitably carries a woke progressive, not only across the goal line, but out of the end zone and sometimes out of the stadium. They don't have any breaks. There's an existential dread that is being imposed on people who otherwise wouldn't have it. There's a moral black, a campaign of moral blackmail uh, under that, underway here that wouldn't be objectionable if this was a matter of choice, frankly. Now, I have kids. I find a measure of satisfaction in family, as I suppose a lot of your audience does. Not everybody does. And if it was a personal choice to uh, eschew, uh, you know, creating a family, then that's one matter. But what we're seeing here and what I quote of a lot of these people uh, who, are, who are receptive to this message is that they desperately want a family. They want the satisfaction found in parenthood. They're afraid for it. They're afraid that they're consigning their children to a horrible future in which the living will envy the dead. And it is uh, truly bizarre and frankly, uh, in, in an effort to immiserate the people around you, perhaps so that they will share your misery. It is an unsustainable condition in the absence of a coercive mechanism. And that coercive mechanism in this case is imposing on them existential dread because of their conditions, climate change, um, it, it, rising income inequality, the sort of stuff that we could otherwise navigate, you know, pretty effectively. And you will still uh, manage the, the to The panic over the virus, the endless virus. I'm going to come back with Noah Rothman. We're going to continue our conversation about his brand new book, The New Puritans, The Rise of the New Puritans. It is over at Amazon.com. If you follow my Twitter feed, you can go and link it and order it right now. And, and you will, it will not only entertain you, but it will inform you. The bell curve is always the bell curve, and the woke is our all. There's a bell curve among the woke, and there are some really crazy ones. Noah's read them all. I'll be right back with more of them. Don't forget, during the break, uh, you can go to get his book, but you can also go to relieffactor.com. If you're going to go out for your morning run like I do after the show, if you're going to get on an airplane like I'm going to do later in the day to fly to the swamp, if you've got to do anything that involves anything you don't like, like putting things in the overhead bag, which I hate, if it causes you discomfort, try relieffactor.com. 1995 gets you started. Three-week trial. Pat, and you know what? You don't have to like it if it works. I take it every single morning in the first hour, and I remind you about it two more times. Relieffactor.com. Coming back with Noah Rothman on the rise of the new Puritan. Stay tuned. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt. It is the uh, 23rd year, the 22nd anniversary of the Hugh Hewitt Show. More importantly, the 40th anniversary of my marriage was yesterday, and we always celebrate by playing the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt's favorite song. I am joined in this anniversary show by Noah Rothman, a friend of a few years' acquaintance. Now, he writes often at Commentary. I used to be on Morning Joe with him when I worked at NBC and MSNBC. Noah is the author of a brand spanking, fabulous new book, The Rise of the New Puritans, which I spent the last three days in airports reading and I want to say, Noah, the mark of a good book of the center right. I don't often read in the center right because I don't learn anything. I've been doing this so long. But I learned a lot from you. I learned a couple of things that I did not know I want the audience to know. I did not realize that comedy is in a death spiral at the box office. That, uh, you know, I've been the subject of attack by a lot of Hollywood people over the years. Seth Rogen among them, David Price, uh, uh, David Simon, I mean, the guy who did The Wire. I, and I don't care. I, but, but I don't, I, I do care that they're killing off comedy that woke has made the joke a thing of the past, at least at the box office. Would you unravel for people what has happened to comedy releases on the big screen as a result of the new Puritanism? Yeah, big screen um, 
major motion, major uh, feature length motion pictures, uh, comedic screenplays are on the decline rapidly. Uh, you could say the same actually for um, really uh, effective sex sequences. In fact, this is something that uh, film uh, uh, critics have been noting and lamenting, although they have also created this very same conditions that have brought about the thing they're lamenting, their despair. Um, Comedy is declining, and you, you talk about you, people who pitch these scripts, like Will Ferrell is, is quoted in this script as saying, you know, it's just touchy. It's touchy out there. There's a lot, there's sensitivity to the joke. And in my comedy chapter, the chapter that talks, part of it talks about uh, comedy, it discusses the ways in which uh, cultural arbiters who determine what is, uh, what is appropriate for audiences these days do a great disservice to a lot of the comics, particularly anti-comics, who play around with themes that aren't especially funny. And there's room to be a monologist. You know, the, the Spalding Grays of the world have their, have their audiences. But what enlivens them, and I, I pick on Hannah Gadsby in particular, uh, who's an Australian anti-comic, who is funny when she wants to be. But there are and anti-comic is the best term. Would you but, explain for the benefit of the audience who've never heard of her, and there will be some, who she is and why she is an anti-comic who's funny? A comedian? Occasionally. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> when she wants to be. I'm, she'll make a punchline and make you laugh, but she will also... Um, build the same tension that would lead to a laugh and not allow you that, not allow the release of a punchline. She'll circle back to the joke she told five minutes ago and, and make you interrogate yourself and say, why, why did you think that was funny? Was my pain really all that in, important to, to, you should laugh at it? Um, and that's the stuff that enlivens her audience. They get a pre profound thrill from the pain, the pain quote, the assault, the interrogation that you experience. Um, this is not a joke per se, because you're not supposed to laugh. I mean, that's really the emphasis of a joke. Um, so they, so the, the, on the one side, they're emphasizing the pain that someone experienced so that you could have a punchline. On the other side, uh, they're, they're going after what they call right-wing comedy. There's a gentleman whose essay I pick apart in this piece, Seth Simons, who identifies the, uh, the, all, the establishment of the alt-right in a form of comedy that was really common in the early 2000s, colloquially called cringe, which leverages horrible things for laughter, racism, sexism, homophobia, assault. The sort of thing that you would, the clinical description of dark humor would make you think, well, these people must be terrible if you like that joke, much less tell it. You must be a bad person. But this is the essence of dark humor, of gallows humor, the ability to plumb the depths of human despair to make it endurable, to laugh your way up the gallows steps. And he identifies in, all, in this alt-right, you know, inception, the genesis of the alt-right in comedy, and drags it all the way to January 6th. This is, the, this is the why we had the January 6th riots, this black swan event, um, which has somehow uh, uh, happened as a result of this pretty mundane phenomena, dark humor. And these two conditions are at work to try to destroy comedy, to make sure that you don't have the joy of a laugh, the release of a laugh, because that's a trite pleasure. It's a frivolous pleasure. And it does not advance the, the, or the, the puritanical progressive project. Uh, which compels you as a duty, as a responsible human being, to dwell on the world's horrors at all times and in all things. Even your desire for escapism is sort of a moral failing on your part. If you really are to make a better world and commit to this moral obligation that you have to do this labor, to work in the pursuit of a better world, then you can't allow yourself an escape. There is no escape. And Noah Rothman, perhaps the most shocking revelation to me, is that race essentialism uh, in, the, in the course of the rise of the new Puritans, which you've got to say seven times or people won't know to go and buy it, is that race essentialism has entered into baseball card collecting. Now, I have a brother-in-law who was uh, grew up on a farm, and that means going to school on a bus, coming back and working morning, noon, and night. He has a baseball card collection, which is magnificent and massive, and it's in pristine condition. And I did not realize it was an agent of uh, racism. And would you explain how race essentialism, it's not just Colin Kaepernick kneeling, it's not just the NFL losing its market share or ESPN becoming unwatchable, it's baseball card collecting. Yeah, that was there was an early 2000s study uh, aptly titled Racism, Racism Everywhere, um, which identified in the values of baseball cards uh, a sort of a racist impulse that in, resulted in lower values for players of color. Uh, that was otherwise not the case experienced by white players. Now, that study has since been debunked, uh, or at least uh, a more uh, accurate uh, reflection of why these values are what they are has taken over in the, in the academic community. But this still maintains its hold over the progressive imagination. Race essentialism finds its way 
into what actors are allowed to play certain roles, um, what clothing you're allowed to wear. It's a very, it's a sort of puritanical sumptuary law, but the uh, accidents of birth that your garb is supposed to reflect is not economic so much as ethnic. Uh, this is a uniform you're expected to wear to navigate society. And in that baseball card piece, um, it appears in the chapter on hobbies called Fear of God, um, which finds in seemingly banal activities, de home decorating, fly fishing, gardening, jogging, uh, video game playing, half a dozen other uh, otherwise uh, innocuous activities, the sort of lurking seedy underbelly that informs it as long, and you can see it, as long as you have this decoder ring. If you're initiated into this point of view, one of my scholars, who I, who I quote in this, attributes it to a very puritanical tendency, which he called an anxious introspection, which is the belief that sin exists in you in latent form, in vestigial form, and that it has the capacity to uh, erupt and corrupt your environment in ways that are unknowable except to those who are most properly educated in this particular point of view, which is why it, it has become a pastime in its own way to identify the seedy racist workings behind the curtain that render things like sewing uh, to be and knitting to be activities that are um, that have a, a, a racist element to them unless you are properly attuned to the temptations lurking just beneath the surface of your otherwise placid, banal activities. So, so no, I want to propose to you what I took away from this is my next step theory. First of all, uh, wokeism has introduced a two-track mind. We've got to be playing the track of will this offend and ignite a mob at the same time that we are commenting. So you have to do your media hits, and I have to do three hours of radio a day for 23 years, aware that the mob is ready on Twitter and everywhere to come for you. And you have to either sure. be prepared to take the heat or not. But everyone, not just in comedy, that's what I extrapolated out of the, right. uh, the chapter on comedy, but in every pastime in public or that which might be recorded, you must always be on guard because you will set them off. But I also, it, can, it will devour itself. And like the radical right, and this is what I want to put, that there is an essential parallelism between the progressive new P Puritans and the radical alt-right in that they are intolerant of everything and unwilling to even attribute a shred of good faith to everyone. Now, on the first part, what I did not, I think your book went to press before Will Smith slapped Chris Rock. Um, and in that delayed reaction of the audience, uh, where they, they first approved, then they didn't approve, then they booed, and then the Academy revoked, all that was was an accelerated new Puritism trying to process an right. event that many people saw. It's exhausting. We can't do that every day. That's why it's doomed. That's what I took away from the rise of the new Puritanism is that woke is doomed. Have many other people come to the same conclusion? I, I'm not in the way that you've expressed it. No. I mean, what you described there is an intellectual reaction that overtakes what was otherwise an instinctual response. The instinctual yes. response is horror. The intellectual yep. reaction there is to say, well, whoa, 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 whoa. maybe we can contextualize this in a way that will not yes. offend our, our co-religionists here. Um, the instinctual response is one of the primary themes of this book because it is so despised. The instinctual gut laugh that erupts from uh, your belly after a ribald joke, an offensive joke. You know, the, the Epicurean sigh that you release after this really sinfully decadent meal. I mean, these are your body. Or if that, that, that man's kneeling during the national anthem, my instinctual response is that's not patriotic but then sure. we've been contextualizing Colin Kaepernick and everybody else for years. It's exhausting. So the the um, if if there's an end to this that I can identify from the past, uh, I think it is encapsulated in the phrase "banned in Boston." Uh, so in the 19th, I century, love that chapter. Com Comstockery uh, at its height, you know, the mainline Protestantism, where which is the nucleus where progressivism emerged, um, had organized itself around a campaign to fight one of the most insidious evils imaginable, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Um, so, and it was profoundly successful. They got it, it was not published in Boston because of this movement. Plays were bodlerized, songs were not allowed to be played on the radio, dime store novels popular everywhere in the country, you couldn't get them, they're behind locked doors in this part of the world. And this was an esoteric feature of the Boston scene, and indeed an, a, a warning against impure, licentious literature, until it wasn't until a certain point at which a backlash formed and a young, a young reactionary set 
rejected this. And this, this banned in Boston label went from being a warning against imperial literature to a powerful advertisement for it. Publishers actively sought to have their books banned in Boston to increase sales nationally. The modern equivalent I submit is banned on Facebook, banned on Amazon, where conservative authors, and it's primarily conservative authors who find themselves running afoul of young, ill-equipped censors, um, see their books explode in popularity in ways that are not justified by the PR campaign around them, by the what their publishers have put into these, these books. They find themselves being advertised and their themes advertised and finding real commercial success as a result of this censorious reaction against them. So I can- I A case in point that you cite, Josh Hawley. Uh, right. Josh came out with Regnery, which is owned by Salem. I want to disclose that. And they, get, they made a lot of money off Josh Hawley's book. And it's a very good book. I had the senator on. Only after, I think it was Simon & Schuster, I don't want to slander someone wrongly, I think it was Simon & Schuster pulled the plug on Josh Hawley's book because they did not want Josh Hawley after the infamous photo, which is not contextualized. The woke never contextualized, but always insist on being contextualized. He sold a lot more books and made much more of an impact on big tech's future than had he just put out another senator's book on another subject that most people wouldn't read. Right. Yeah, likely. I mean, no offense. I have not read the senator's book yet, but most likely a rather dry vehicle for a politician's national ambitions. You wouldn't usually become a national bestseller, especially uh, one of many who's embarked on this course. Uh, it did so because of this wild reaction against it. I Likewise, I said a variety of authors, Abby Schreier's book, all of them find their the old age, which was this novel that was blurbed by Mike Pence that somehow decided, was banned on Facebook just because it came out in 2020 and Mike Pence had looked at it askance. Um, this sort of thing creates a backlash against it. And so I conclude rather sardonically that it's my fondest hope that somebody cancels this book because everyone will win. Yes, everyone wins. Now, well, let me wrap this up. And you've been very generous with your time, Noah. I did love the book. And I want everyone to go out and get The Rise Thank of the New Puritans. Do you think that we have, in fact, passed into the mockery state? Woke becomes a joke and then it becomes broke. That's what happened with the SPN. First, it, it, you know, people laugh at it up their sleeve. And then all of a sudden your audience is gone. Because if you lose your audience, you lose your income. If you lose your income, you lose your ability. The market, the invisible hand will crush woke. That's my conclusion. What's yours? It's possible. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I think so, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, there's some growing pains yet to be had. It may get worse before it gets better, but you, the seeds of the backlash are rather plain and hard to ignore. So if my, my goal of this book, one, is to give you some sense of how this movement fits in with historical trends and maybe decodes a little bit of why this happens so fast and how it goes away. My second primary objective, I think, is for you to have a good time. I set out to write a book I wanted to read and wanted to write and to enjoy myself at a time when covering politics was a chore, a slog. The life that I had established for myself that I was enjoying up to a minute ago was no longer fun. I hope to, and I'm not alone. I hope to channel that sentiment and give you some permission to laugh, to enjoy yourself, to live a carefree, joyous life because you are setting an example that is far more easy to emulate and more rewarding to emulate than the uh, than the trial that has that these people have imposed on themselves, uh, and and they're, it's sucking the fun out of their lives, and you don't have to do it. Nobody's making you do it. Just don't do it. And for and for the politically active, uh, my audience is seventy percent homeowners with children. That's what, what we do demographic analysis, and homeowners with children are living a difficult life. They don't want to be in trouble. They they don't want to cross the line. I'm here to tell them if you read Noah's book, you will realize you're not alone. Most people don't like the new Puritanism. They want to break free of it. And I think uh, a listener to this show, a reader of my columns, a, a, a consumer of things that I like, and I like the new Purit rise of the new Puritans a lot, they'll be relieved to know that people, other people have the same reaction they do to the excess of woke. And I, I think you're chronicling a moment at which the kimono goes full open and we see just how absurd it is. I really hope so. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Honestly, yes. like if this wasn't if this movement didn't have teeth to it, and it does, I understand that you might feel like there's more risk and reward than living the joyful life that I espouse, and and in mocking the people who engage in these great displays of self sacrifice in pursuit of popularizing the idea that there's world historic import in your burrito. 
there isn't. Yeah. You don't have but, to. But I have to ask you one hard question. Did you have to go back at the end and make sure that you included the necessary disclaimer? I know, because I know you, I know you think that the Me Too movement was justified in its origin and that some of its targets were absolutely correct to be sure. brought down. You have to write that down. At the beginning of every chapter, you must make the disclosure that there is virtue in the original impulse. You do that repeatedly. Did you check yourself? Did, you, did someone check your homework to make sure you had done the appropriate contextualizing so that no one could say that Noah Rothman was not sensitive to the concerns of the legitimate Me Too movement? I don't think so because I did it initially, and I am. The chapters in this book are organized around unimpeachable moral virtues, piety, yes. prudence, temperance, austerity, the fear of God and order. And the, piety, the chapter on temperance that you're describing, which is on sex and booze, um, the progressive left has rediscovered a very old moral order that conservatives know to work. It is that when you don't have any boundaries for yourself and your loved ones, when social situations in which men and women are present, and that is bathed in booze, Bad things can happen. This is something again and that again. Progressive, progressive left is rediscovering this moral precept that the right has known for a very long time. This is an effective way to establish social order. Um, it is just it's coming with a lot of growing pains because this licentiousness that uh, typ typified the, the progressive left of an earlier generation and no longer does is found is finding a very difficult equilibrium with this new far more austere generation. But the hedonism that was the um, the Hugh Hefner version, you know, idea of how social societies should organize themselves, uh, sows the seeds of its own destruction because of its failure to establish borders and boundaries for people. So I am sympathetic towards the theory that they're working towards. It's the means and the methods that have become so onerous and intolerance, intolerable. Perfectly balanced, wonderfully written, the rise of the new Puritans in bookstores everywhere. Noah, continued success to you, and may the book tour go well. They're never fun. But you are doing your work. Just remember, keep saying the rise of the new Puritans again and again and again. Noah, have a great day. Thank you, Hugh. Appreciate it. Thank you.